Life Audio. Nobody gets pregnant or adopts and goes, oh, I know someday I will be calling the police on this sweet little child and watching them handcuff put in the back of a cop car. I mean, it's just the most, I, I still get teary eyed just talking about it. It's the most heart wrenching thing. I was so desperate in that moment. I knew that the situation, and it's too long to get into the whole story, but I knew that the situation was out of my control. And so there were so many layers of this, a layer of how did we get to this point? And then of course that comes with self-criticism. What did you do? What did you not do? Why can't you control your child? You know, all that stuff. And then there's just so much pain. It's so, it's like anger at yourself and pain and fear of what the future holds. Like if, if this is what we're doing and he's only 15, what's next? Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we discuss powerful truths, quiet anxiety, and fear big and small. We are passionate about helping God's children experience soul, deep, emotional, and spiritual freedom. And we want to inspire you to share that freedom with others. We would love to connect with you online or to come speak at your next event. Visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. Jennifer Slattery, and I know the anguish of watching a loved one struggle with significant mental health challenges. I know the drive to try to fix them or their situation, and I know the pain that comes when my fear and my anxiety lead me to behave in unhelpful ways. And considering in the United States, over 21 million adults and 15% of our youth between the ages of 12 and 15 experience major depression, I suspect many of you can relate. And I hope and I pray that this episode with author and comedian Christina Kuzmich brings you encouragement, hope, and practical insights regarding how you can love your depressed loved one well. Christina, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Christina Kuzmich was born in Croatia and is a world-renowned speaker known for her unique insight and humor on family-related topics. She currently lives in Southern California with her husband, where her most important, rewarding, and exhausting careers include being a sanitation engineer, a chef, a chauffeur, and conflict resolution guru for her three mostly satisfied clients, her children. In her book, I Can Fix This and Other Lies I Told Myself, while parenting my struggling child, she shares her raw and honest journey walking beside her son as he battled major depression. And her testimony reveals a mother who felt lost, scared, and desperate to save her son. With full transparency, Hughes McDowell's deep into her family's challenges, her insecurities, and the mistakes she made while revealing invaluable lessons and the small changes that made a big difference. Featuring an urgent and affirming foreword by New York Times bestselling clinician, Dr. Shafali Sabari, I Can Fix This, debunks 10 parenting truths that kept Christina and her family in crises. Christina, I really appreciate you being here. I know this is a challenging, a, a really intense topic, especially for listeners right now who are right, right in the throes of it. And in your book, you talked about what a sweet and gentle child Luca was, or so your son Luca was, but you began to notice his behavior change when he was nearing his teen years, correct? Yeah. So he was just like this full of life kid, hyper, very creative. He just was sunshine. That's the only way I can describe it. And then he, around 12, 13, I started seeing some changes and I thought, oh, I know exactly what this is. This is teenage stuff. Like, because I had been a teenager, obviously we've all survived that. And also right out of college, I worked as an assistant theater director at a high school and worked with teenagers for a long time. And so I just thought I'd mastered this whole teen thing. And I guess that's one of the first mistakes I made is I came from a place of assumption. I see his behavior. I know what this is. I know how to handle it instead of coming from a place of curiosity and really from the beginning, realizing there's a deeper issue here. And so you initially just thought he was being moody, but then you started to recognize it was, it was maybe more, something more was going on. Like walk us through that. Sure. I started to notice mood, you know, moodiness and he didn't want to be around me as much. And 
he's starting to rebel a little bit and he's starting to talk back. And then I realized, you know, again, to me, it was like, oh, he's just being, uh, he's excelling at being a teenager. Let's put it that way. Maybe being a little extra teenagery more than other teenagers, but that's it. And then I realized, oh, wait, he's not just isolating from me. He's isolating from his friends. He's isolating from everything that used to bring him joy, hobbies, sports. He, he has like nothing brings him joy anymore. And that's when I was like, and, and also just the behavior escalated so quickly. He was on the honor roll. Now he was failing classes. You know, there was just like these big changes that made me realize this is much more serious than just teenage hormones. So I actually listened to another one of your interviews from back, back, I don't know when it aired, but where you were talking about your time as a single mom Mm -hmm. and how you yourself during that season experienced depression. Do you feel like that season maybe helped you a bit, like your perspective when your son was going through his own struggle? You know what? It did both actually. In some ways it hurt it because depression shows up differently for different people. And so I, a lot of times, again, came from a place of assumption because I've been through this. I know what he's feeling. I know what he's going through, but no, it's different. And, you know, some people, you know, some kids show depression by overachieving and being that quote unquote good kid in the family. Depression can show up so many different ways. And not only does it show up different ways, but different people need different things. You know, I always say that parenting is not like riding a bike. Just because you have your first, you know, your first kid is a bike and you got to figure out like, oh, the second one will be easy. I, I know how to operate this thing. Well, the second one will not be a bike. The second one will be a tractor. You're going to have to learn from scratch. I feel the same is true with mental health, right? Just because something works for one person doesn't mean it's going to work for the next. And so in some ways it hurt the situation because I came from a place of assumption. And in some ways later, once I was done with that mistake, it helped because I understood what it feels like to not be able to get out of bed. And it's not just laziness. And and I struggled with that even as a parent watching him. It was like, oh my gosh, why is he so lazy? And then I'd go, wait, were you lazy when you were struggling to get out of bed? So I guess it both, it did both. <laughs> yeah. And you also shared how when his behavior began to intensify, which I felt like this was so helpful for maybe listeners to hear, but you volleyed between denial and and fear so what was kind of driving your fear and and then driving denial and and why do you think you kind of bounced between the two yeah I compare it to like two politicians wanting my vote denial and fear and I'm like trying to figure out who to vote for and it was constantly you know oh I found out he's vaping denial would be like oh whatever teenagers do that and then fear was like oh my gosh what's next if he's vaping now he's gonna be doing coke next it was constantly that kind of stuff oh he's failing some classes yeah well your grades dropped a little bit too when you were in high school and then fear being like he's gonna be a high school dropout and be on the streets and in prison and I think that's very relatable to a lot of parents who are suddenly seeing these big changes there's a part of you that just wants to believe it's all normal and it's going to be okay. It's like we're comforting ourselves with that, right? And then there's a part of you that is freaking out. And a lot of that is because, oh my goodness, I I don't have any control over this. Like I'm trying all these different things and it's not helping. And so trying to not give in to either of those and just deal with reality can be really, really hard. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, and this was something I loved in your book. Actually, I think that, I want to implement in every conversation, but you emphasize the importance of approaching conversations from a place of curiosity. So what might this look like, whether you're a parent with a teen struggling with depression, or maybe it's your sibling, or maybe it's your spouse, what would it look like to approach them from a place of of curiosity? Yeah. I mean, bottom line, we all have our preconceived ideas and we all have our, oh, I know what would help this situation. Or, well, I know someone who's been through it or I've been through it. So I know what they're going. We all have this stuff. Or again, like I was, well, he's being a moody teenager. We we have to sort of completely put all of that aside. You cannot come from a place of curiosity if you've already decided what the situation is and what it needs. And a lot of us, our generation has been taught because the way we were raised that a parent is supposed to know what to do in all situations. A parent sees a problem and they can solve the problem. That's a good parent. No, a good parent is a student because the only expert at being Luca was Luca. 
And as much as my ego was telling me that I know what's best for him, I needed to learn more than I needed to yap, right? So coming from a place of curiosity means putting all of that aside and just listening in a way where you listen without knowing what you want to ask next or already thinking how you want to fix it or already trying to argue their feeling because that's not really what they feel. But all that stuff needs to be put aside. I think one of the most beautiful things we can tell somebody who is opening up to us, whether it's our child or spouse or whoever, is tell me more. That's it. Tell me more. I want to learn. Not only I want to learn because you're the only expert, but also as a parent, we're teaching our kids to trust themselves. I trust that what you're feeling is real. I trust that you will know what you need. I want to support and I want to guide, but I need to learn. So curiosity is sort of that complete blank slate and just sitting the way I, I um, write in the book, learning to stand in awe of Luca's story. Not what I think his story should be, not what I wished it would be, not what the world said it would be, not even what he wishes it would be, even he. What is it? Standing in awe of his story. Well, what I hear in that too is assuming the best in your child. I think it's easy when you have a teen to, oh, well, they're rude or they're entitled or they're lazy. What I'm hearing from you is you can't be curious without assuming the best in them as well. Would you say that's correct? Yeah, I think that a lot of times we look at our kids' behavior and then we come from a place of fear because we don't want to raise entitled, awful human beings, right? And so we're like, okay, we got to just nip this in the butt and fix it. And I don't believe that there really are bad kids. I think the kids are in pain. So if you, if every single thing your child does that in your eyes is negative behavior, and it can be something little, or it can be something really big and dangerous, what if you saw them as a child who is in need, in pain, right? Every behavior is communicating a need or a want. And I think for me, just making that switch, and I had to remind myself in the moments, you know, he would punch a hole in the wall or he would scream in my face. And by the way, I'm not saying any of that should just be like, okay, well, he's struggling, so he can do whatever. No, no. But if I immediately decided, okay, nope, Christina, see him as a child in pain, in need. I was able to approach it differently. I was able to speak to him differently. And it actually made those changes that we want where we're teaching our child not to have a certain behavior, not to repeat certain negative behavior, right? So just having that compassion. I mean, it's what we would want for us, right? We've all done stupid stuff and we've all made mistakes and we still do in a, into a, our adulthood. What if we were immediately by somebody in charge labeled as, okay, you're bad, you're rebellious. Instead of, hey, tell me more, why? Why, why did you do that? I, I genuinely, I want to know where that came from. That's a very different approach. Yeah. Do you think that helped dial your fear down, your anxiety down as well when you shifted to curiosity? I would say that my fear was so out of control. I don't know that it helped my actual deep, deep fear, but it helped me be able to talk to him calmly. This is what it did. It didn't eliminate the fear, but it made me more in control of the fear instead of the fear being in control of me, if that makes sense. That's powerful. Tell us about when things began and to escalate. There was, I know there was one part in your book where, I mean, your, your heart had to have been shredded when you had to call the authorities on your son. What was that like? What was going on? Nobody gets pregnant or adopts and goes, oh, I know someday I will be calling the police on this sweet little child and watching them handcuff put in the back of a cop car. I mean, it's just the most, I, I still get teary. I just talking about it. it's the most heart wrenching thing. I was so desperate in that moment. I knew that the situation, and it's too long to get into the whole story, but I knew that the situation was out of my control. And so there were so many layers of this, a layer of how did we get to this point? And then of course that comes with self-criticism. What did you do? What did you not do? Why can't you control your child? You know, all that stuff. And then there's just so much pain. It's so, it's like anger at yourself and pain and fear of what the future holds. Like if, if this is what we're doing and he's only 15, what's next, right? It's just one of the worst things. But Luca, my son, who actually wrote the last chapter of the book, he to this day says, mom, you did what you needed to do. And it was, it was the first sort of turning point. People always ask me, what was the turning point? There were many. Um, this was the first sort of like, okay, this requires way more intense help than I'm able to offer or once a week therapist is able to offer or whatever. One 
thing I really loved about your whole story at every section, I saw that you were getting help. You got, it seemed like you got help from your husband, the support there, you put your son in therapy, and then you actually saw a therapist, correct, to get guidance. And then when you needed a higher level help. So I would say to those listening, sometimes I think we pull away from that out of shame maybe, or, or guilt or whatever. And instead of reaching out and getting the help that we need, I'm really curious during that time. So you already mentioned how your fear and the pain and the anguish, what are some things you did just to maintain your own sanity? It was hard at the time because how do you even find time to think about your own needs, right? During the night, I would go and check on him in the middle of the night, multiple times every night. You know how, when you have a newborn, and they're so still when they're sleeping. And so a lot of us would put our face close to their face just to feel their breath. I was doing this to my son when he was 15, 16, 17, going into his room just to make sure he hadn't taken his life. So when you are living that life, and by the way, I have two other kids that have completely separate needs and things, right? And I have in-laws who live down the street that we're trying to help with things. And I have a marriage and I have a career. It is so easy to just forget about ourselves. And I thought I was doing a good job at the time because like you said, I was in therapy. I was in family therapy with him and I was attending support groups and I was spending time with friends and all that. And what I realized later, what I was doing is kind of like when your house is a mess and you clean it just enough so it's livable or, you know, someone's coming over and so you quickly shove things in the messy drawer or whatever in that closet. But I wasn't doing the deep cleaning. I wasn't opening every drawer and taking stuff out. And I wish I'd done that sooner. It took time to do that. But One thing I really learned during that process is that we sometimes think that the only way to show our loved ones who are suffering our love and empathy is if we suffer as well. And I had to realize that positive feelings are not something that I have to earn. I have a right to enjoy my life. I have a right to find joy and to, you know, ask myself every day, am I okay? Am I, do I have everything I want? Because I sort of got tricked into believing that once Luca is happy, then I'm allowed to be happy. Once Luca is fully enjoying his life, then I'm allowed to fully enjoy my life. So just having that perspective keeps us from getting the help we need or, or finding those moments of joy because they feel so trivial. It's like, why would I pursue that right now when my kid is suffering? But that's exactly what we need, right? And I, I tell parents all the time, never feel guilty taking care of the most important person in your child's life. And that's you. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves, who is the steady, semi-sane human who our child can lean on? So, I mean... It was a process, but I got to a point later where I was, I I am very good at taking care of myself (laughs) and I hate the word selfless because, you know, selfless means either not taking care of, you know, worrying about everybody else and not yourself or worrying about everybody else's needs more than your own. And I just think, how is that, how has that become praised in our society to be selfless? How is a mother supposed to keep her sanity if she has no concern for self? And so I just decided to be as selfless as I could in the sense of, I am going to make sure that I am okay. And I'm not taking away from my child by doing that. I am giving to my child because I'm giving them a healthier, saner, happier mother and support system. And you're demonstrating what do you do in times of crises, which I think is hugely helpful as well. The support group, I remember one part in your book where you were talking about people kind of in your world, becoming alert to your chaos. And you said a phrase, which I love, you said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. How did being able to connect with others without kind of that allowing judgment, how did that help you in your journey? I mean, so first of all, the no thank you thing, it started when my son was being put in the back of a cop car and we're new to the neighborhood and there are two neighbors across the street. I haven't met them yet. And by the way, our neighborhood's very quiet. Cop cars, you know, police officers don't show up. There's two police vehicles. And these people are across the street and they're staring. And I don't know what they're saying. And I don't know what they're going to tell the neighbors. And they don't know why my kid's being put in the back of a cop car. They don't know that he's not going to jail, but going to hospital, all that stuff. And I remember so clearly thinking, no, thank you. It's the first time that thought came into my mind of just like, no, I, no, no, thank you. I'm not picking that up. And then I started that night, I lay down and I was waiting for a call from the ER where they had taken him. And I started doing the whole, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? And is it because of this? And should I have done more of this? And again, no, thank you. No, thank you. Because what happens is other people's judgments and our own self-criticism 
become so loud that it distracts us from focusing and being 100% present for what we actually need to be present for. It's impossible to give that stuff energy and have enough energy left for ourselves and our child, right? Something's gonna have to give. So I started saying, no, thank you. And then as Luca and I joined support groups, here's the thing, I think every human being, like a common need for any human being in any culture of any age is, I just need to know I'm not the only one. I just need to know I'm not the only crazy one or the only this or the only one or the only one having this thought in my head that I'm embarrassed to share or this insecurity or this fear, right? And those support groups, it was like 20, 30 different families at times and they were so open. And I'm sitting there and I'm hearing people talk about the same stuff my family's going through. And now I feel less alone. And I don't feel as bad about myself because my goodness, these parents are going through the same thing and they seem lovely. They don't seem like inadequate losers, you know? And now a kid is opening up about what they're feeling. It's making Luca go, oh, wait, we're allowed to say this out loud? Okay. It was just, I am such a big advocate for support groups because I think therapy is great. I think medication has its place. I think all that stuff is great. But there's something so powerful sitting across humans who are not experts, who are not there because they got some degree, who are just there because they're also in it. And they are saying the things that's in your head. And you're like, wow, we can say this out loud and we're okay. I want to speak to those who are in the, the, like, in the midst of it right now and holding tight to hope in, mm. in the journey. And tell us about your cover, the story behind your cover and what that did for you when you're in that unknown, like, is my son going to be okay? Yeah. So my son was in a psychiatric hospital that, that was after I called the police for 10 days. And then he was immediately transferred to residential treatment center for about six weeks. And the day after he left the residential center, we flew to Croatia, where I'm from, to visit my family. And he was really struggling. I mean, I was thinking, I got my hopes up, right? As parents do. I got my hopes up. He's had all this time in the hospital and he's at all this time in the residential treatment center and therapy every day and medication was adjusted and all this stuff. And we get to Croatia and it's the first time I'm really spending every day with him. And he is self-harming. He would um, self-harm by punching tiles, bathroom tiles, and his knuckles were always bloody. And he was isolating. I found him one day. He had been under a bed laying for hours. He just wanted to get away from me. And he was so suicidal. And I was just so scared. So anyway, one day I suggested we take a family walk. And there's this beautiful uh, path by the Adriatic Sea that near my parents' house that we walk on. And Luca agreed, which was a really big deal because at that time Luca was still just pushing me away. And Luca and I are walking ahead of everybody else. And my husband was behind us. And Luca was actually talking to me, which by the way, so many times, you know, so I, I wrote in the book how sometimes we have to go through hell days to appreciate that average days are really great days. So he's talking to me and I put my hand on his back at one point and he let me, he didn't just push me off. So my husband quickly grabbed his phone and he snapped a picture of this because he wanted me to remember this moment because there were so many more moments, right? And my head was full of memories of just the negative. And so I was so glad he snapped it because I probably would have overlooked it because the bad memories would have, you know, overshadowed this beautiful walk I had with my son. And I love that he took that picture. And I remember looking at that picture on so many rough days and just having hope of like, there will be another walk. And there will be another time where he will open up to me. And there will be another time where he will allow me to show affection. It will come, it will come. And when we got the book deal, I they were kind of talking to me, the publisher was talking about the cover and I remember this photo and I sent it to them. And it was, it's so amazing because back then, you know, I have a rule with my kids where I won't talk, I won't say anything about them publicly without their permission. I figured he'd never want me to share this and we'd never write a book. And so for that to now become a cover is just so powerful to me. And you know, especially because I feel like the reason I wrote this book is to give that hope to parents for are not, you know, able to have the relationship with their kid they want and their kid is behaving in a way that's scaring them so badly and they're worried about losing their child. For that picture that gave me so much hope to hope to be now in the book is just, I don't know, it's really meaningful. Yeah, I, I've actually shared a phrase that you said in there and I just heard you say now with, with other moms who are having a difficult time. You said you just wanted, I don't remember what was going on, but you're having a conversation with him and you said you just wanted to keep him talking. Yeah, yeah. And then that's that whole thing that we touched on earlier about curiosity, right? The tell me more. And that was a very hard thing for me to fix about myself 
which by the way, I write in the book how what really made the biggest difference is me quitting trying to fix him and work on fixing myself and realizing how much unhealed parts of myself I was bringing into this situation. But, you know, I, w- I-, I was very quick to, because of my fear and control, to just want to give advice and to just want to, you know, he would start opening up and I would immediately just want to give him all my brilliance, right? And just going, no, because every time I did that, he would shut down. If I, I realized if I don't shut up, he will shut down. And I think that's true for most teenagers. If we don't learn to shut up, they will shut down. So when your kid is speaking to you, I don't care how scary it is and what they're saying is terrifying to you. And by the way, you have a perfect solution to that whole thing they're whatever struggling with. Just listen, keep them talking. That's beautiful. The other thing I really loved that you did that that was like, I felt like a, a driving theme in your book is you kept showing up. And, and even when, and I, I think listeners, I think this is important for them to hear because I think sometimes we think, I remember when my daughter was a teenager, I'm like, she doesn't want to be with me, right? Like, and so, so tell me about, there was a time, numerous times where he's like, get away, stay away from me quite loudly. Yeah. One of the pivotal moments was when the police took him, they were waiting for a bed to open up in a psychiatric hospital. So he had to spend a day in the ER. And if you've ever had a loved one who is on a psych hold, they don't put them in like a separate little section of the ER. They have them in the hall so they could be monitored at all times. And so he's in this hall and it's one of those, like the minute I enter the ER, the bed's right there. He can see me across this long hall. And um, he just kept telling me to you know, every time he saw me, he was like, get out, get the F out, get the F out. I don't want to see you get the F out. And I just kept showing up and showing up and showing up. And at one point he said to me, stop showing up. You are wasting your time. I don't want to see you or something like that. And I, it was the first time where I like lost my cool that day. And I spoke very passionately. And I said, you will never be a waste of my time. And I will never stop showing up for you. And it was the first time that he quieted down and he actually let me sit. And what that made me realize and that's why I kept showing up for him from then on always is that he does want me there. He does want me there. He needs me there. But you know what happens? And, and my son said this, and he might've even written this chapter. I can't remember. He was behaving like he hated me, but really he hated himself. And all those, I hate you, mom, you're an effing blah, blah, blah. And all those things were really him screaming, mom, help me. I hate myself. I want to die. And when you hate yourself, well, you don't want people near you because you don't feel lovable and you don't feel deserving, right? And it feels weird. It feels uncomfortable to have someone pour love on you. I remember when we were waiting for the police to show up, my husband had my son sort of, he was holding him so that my son wouldn't hurt himself or somebody else. And I got down, my son was on the ground and I got down his level and I said, I love you because I just felt like he 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 feels like I know he feels like a monster right now from his behavior. And I know I want him to know that even now, even in this moment, he is so loved and he spit in my face. And I just said it again. I love you. And he kept spitting and I kept saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then it wasn't until later that he told me, mom, I never hated you. I hated myself. And so just showing up and by the way, showing up for yourself too, right? But just showing up is so powerful. We parents are clueless so often, not because we're inadequate, because we're human, not because there's anything wrong with us. We're not supposed to know how to figure it all out. We're not supposed to be perfect. We're not supposed to have all the answers. It would be weird if we did, right? So, so often when I felt lost, I was like, okay, the one thing I know to do is to just show up and be present. And that sometimes is the most powerful thing you can do. Yeah. Well, and I want to end this conversation. He actually... So you guys are in a, a pretty good place right now, right? And he wrote you something beautiful regarding your showing up. So I'd like to close with just sharing when he got in a place of increased health, what his perspective was on your showing up. Yeah, that was the letter he wrote when he was in the residential treatment center. Yeah, and we were like really struggling. We were really struggling. And again, he always acted like he hated me. And he wrote um, this beautiful note in his journal residential center about how my mom is always there for me. And he started bringing up things from the past, how when I was broke and, you know, I took care of them and she makes me the most beautiful cakes and all these things. But what's really just interesting now when Luca and I talk about these things is just hearing his perspective 
of, you know, mom, I took it all out on you because I knew you'd never leave me, which is like a really messed up, screwed up compliment, I guess. But, you know, our kids will act so awful to us, but it's like they have all this pain that they're carrying and they don't know what to do with it. A lot of times we as adults don't even know how to process all our pain. And so it comes off as rage and anger. It's like they have to do something with it because they can't carry it. And they take it out on the person that they actually feel the safest with. And I don't know, just reading that little note from him and then other things he's he's written poetry later about me and stuff. Just That was just like part of his therapy. Um, I realized my son knew he was so loved and he knew that I would never abandon him and never leave him. And he knew that even at his worst, I was steady. And I think that's, I mean, one of the most beautiful things. And by the way, for any parent that's going through this now with their child, my kid feels so bad still about things that have happened and things he's done. And, you know, at one point he started crying and he was like, I'm so sorry I did all this too. I'm so sorry I put you through so much. And I remember my husband, because I was saying, Brad, I forgive you for everything. It's all in the past. And my husband said, hey, Luca, she's forgiven you, but I don't think you've forgiven yourself. And it was such like a moment for Luca. So all that to say, just to repeat, your children are not bad kids. They're kids in pain. And just, just show them that they are so loved. They are so loved. Even at quote unquote, their worst, they are so loved. And hopefully someday you will get those words that I've gotten so many times since of, I love you. And I'm so grateful for you. I love that. And so I, your book, I think it's a powerful resource, not just to, like you said, help people recognize they're not alone, but you give a lot of great, even both when you share the things you wish you'd done differently, and then also the things that you found to be helpful. So again, her book is titled, I Can Fix This. It's a raw testimony told through the eyes of a mother who felt lost, scared, and desperate to save her son. With full transparency, Kuzmich delves deep into her family's challenges, insecurities, and the mistakes she made while revealing invaluable lessons and the small changes that made a big difference. Through this, she discusses the long-term benefits of prioritizing our own needs amidst our children's struggles, and she emphasizes self-care is not selfish, And she also emphasizes that there's not one simple, clear answer to mental health struggles, not having all the answers or being able to fix the painful struggles our kids are experiencing does not signify our inadequacy and many more truths that she presents in this book. A great, again, a great resource, not just for those who have kids who are struggling, but really, I think (laughs) anyone who's trying to be human, and I love what you said, you think every, every human should have a therapist from birth, but (laughs) learning how to be human, to love others well, especially those who are struggling with mental health challenges. Christina, thank you for, please convey to Luca my gratitude for his vulnerability also to allow this book to go out. And and in the interviews, I watch your interviews on Instagram and and things. So those are very helpful. And this has been a great book. This has been a great, important conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and having this conversation. I appreciate it. Wasn't that a powerful conversation? I'm so grateful that Christina was willing to share her experiences and her insights with us. I want to thank you for listening. If you haven't done so, I encourage you to subscribe. Then you won't miss a single episode. And we've got some great ones coming up. Share it with your family and your friends. And we would be highly encouraged if you would rate this podcast as well. That encourages us and it helps others to find us. Until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free.